I love chocolate cake. When I was a boy under 10 years of age, I managed to eat too much chocolate cake. It was after a family social gathering, and there was left a half a cake pan full of gooey chocolate frosted chocolate cake. This was good stuff. My mom called it crazy cake. And the chocolate cake all by itself was moist, and it was good. You didn't need to add anything to it. But this cake was frosted. So I snuck an extra piece. And then I got in an extra piece after that. Before long, I was sneaking extra pieces of this chocolatey delight, and the pan was completely emptied. I was full of chocolate cake, the best kind of chocolate cake. I considered this chocolate cake to be a magnificent blessing. Unfortunately for me, I had overdone it. I actually ate so much chocolate cake that I became sick of chocolate. For months, any event that where they had chocolate of any kind, I couldn't stand the sight of it or even the thought of chocolate. And it was a long time before I could consider anything with chocolate in it. Even chocolate chip cookies were an unbearable thought. Eventually, my aversion to chocolate wore off, and I would have some chocolate from time to time as time went by. I had a similar experience with eggs. I enjoyed scrambled eggs, and I ate so many of them. At one point, I just couldn't stand the thought, just couldn't even think about one more egg. Have you ever had too much of a good thing, or you've overdone it? Well, today's title is, When Blessings Become Curses. When Blessings Become Curses. I had the opportunity to be at summer camp for the preteen camp this year in Minnesota, and I was bunking in the dorms with one of the boys' dorms. I wasn't the cabin counselor. I was uh, on the activity staff, and I watched as the uh, uh, boys' counselor went around to the boys in the morning and he would talk softly to them to make sure that those dozen young men uh, were able to get up and get it going. They were about nine and ten years old. And he talked real softly to them and went around to each one. And he was gently waking him us, uh, waking them up. And I couldn't help but think of Proverbs 27, 14. 27, 14. It talks about blessing here. In Proverbs 27, 14, He who blesses his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning, it will be counted a curse to him. So normally when you, you tell somebody about their good features and their good characteristics and how wonderful they are and what a great day it is, it'd probably come across okay. But what if it's early in the morning? You're just barely getting up and then somebody comes along and blesses you with that loud voice. Really, really irritating about what is that? Does that person take it as a blessing? No. What does it say? It will be counted a curse to him. The person in bed thinks, oh no, this is, I am being cursed with this. Now, my father, I don't know that he ever read this verse. He may have. Maybe that's why he did. My father cannot sing, nor could he play guitar. That did not stop him from playing the guitar and singing in the morning to us. So I remember the same monotone song, out of tune guitar that he would strum and you couldn't go back to sleep after that. It was just not possible. Later when I read this verse, I understood it more clearly. That loud voice blessing you in the morning. What a wonderful day. Let's get up and get going. So too much blessing then was counted as a curse. It was another circumstance. <clears throat> I took a young couple who was uh, newlyweds. They were very young and newlyweds, and they were having a marital difficulty. So I escorted them to the local pastor, and I said, this young couple needs your help. And so the, they went through their, their troubles. The, the in-laws were visiting them every day. And so the young man was concerned his in-laws were in the house, and they were a young couple. They wanted to live life and grow. And, uh, and, and so... And they explained how difficult it was because the mommy and daddy were not done being mommy and daddy yet to the little girl who was his wife. And I remember the, the older pastor, he kind of leans forward and he says, I want you to get closer to your parents. 
And the young man goes, how can I get any closer? I, they're there every day. I mean, this is nothing but it's become an irritation. Normally it'd be great, except that they never go away. They're always there. And the pastor says, what I mean is I want you to get closer to your parents. Maybe if you move to this town 60 miles away, or maybe this other town 150 miles away, uh, or even this other town down the road 300 miles away, you could get closer to your parents. And the the realization hit the, the young couple. What the pastor was saying is that in order to be closer to the parents, it would be best to put some distance between them. What was a blessing to have parents nearby turned out to be a curse for them. And they were able then, uh, took the advice and moved some miles away and built a better relationship with the parents. Now, of course, where do the, the where do blessings come from? We can read in Deuteronomy 7 and verse 11. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 11. <clears throat> Therefore, you shall keep the commandment, the statutes and judgments, which I command you today to observe them. Then it shall come to pass because you have because you listen to those judgments and keep and do them that the Lord your God will keep with you the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers and he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your land, your grain, your new wine and oil and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land, which he swore to your fathers to give you pretty profound blessing. If you do what I say, your whole family will be blessed and they will be, uh, and it will go for generations. And then there's this unusual verse in Jeremiah 48, and verse 10. <clears throat> this unusual verse in Jeremiah 48, and verse 10. And I came across this verse, and whoa, this was, this was an odd one. I hadn't really paid attention to this before. In Jeremiah 48, 10, Cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. Hmm. Somebody's doing the work of the Lord. And as we read in Deuteronomy 7, that should be a blessing for them. But they're doing it, uh, and, and the English word is deceitfully. And the next half of the verse is, And cursed is he who keeps back his sword from blood. Well, it's helpful if we want to take a look at the context of what Jeremiah was writing about. Jeremiah was a prophet. He's called one of the major prophets. And he was bringing prophecies against several nations. In chapter 46, he writes God's messages through the prophet Jeremiah regarding the godless nations. So Jeremiah is prophesying about the godless nations. Further in 46, he names one of those, which is Egypt. In 47, he writes God's message to the prophet Jeremiah regarding the Philistines, or those who live on Gaza. Today we call it the Gaza Strip. In chapter 48 of Jeremiah, we start out with the message on Moab. Now, Moab is a country on the, on the southeast side of the Dead Sea. The message on Moab from God of the angel armies. Well, let's take a look at what the New Bible Commentary says about Jeremiah 48, verses 1 through 10. And in that commentary, it says, Yahweh's judgment on Moab's God, Chemosh. To be more specific, in that, in that on verse 10, it says, a curse is invoked upon anyone who might execute the Lord's anger on Moab, but who hesitates in doing so. Now, Moab was involved with false worship. The god Chemosh is another name for one of the false gods of that area. And God said that you needed to execute his wrath, or the people needed to execute his wrath. And they weren't doing it very well. So the reader is, is, as we go through that, is understands that God was angry with Moab and who are descendants of uh, Abraham's nephew Lot, such that even the slow walking executor of God's will, God's anger on Moab, will be cursed. If you're slow to do what he says, it turns out to be a curse. So the sentence shows an emphasis on God's anger with Moab, and that includes God's annoyance with the slowness of those whom he told what to do. So if we follow God's instructions, it would be a blessing. 
But if we slow walk, or as uh, uh, one phrase, or if we hesitate or delay God's instructions, don't follow them out carefully or swiftly, then the blessings will turn into a curse, meaning it will have an ungood ending. So what starts out as something good can be a problem. I ate too much chocolate, and for six months I couldn't stand to look at or, uh, or taste chocolate. I ate too many eggs, and eggs are good for us. And yet I couldn't stand, because I ate too many, I couldn't stand the sight of the smell of eggs for six months. Blessing someone early in the morning is fine, except that when it's a loud voice and it's very early in the morning, it would be counted a curse. Well, when God promises to bless us for following his will, we must be careful to follow his will quickly and carefully, or things won't turn out well for us. Notice the term used in Jeremiah in 48.10, cursed is he who does the work of the Lord deceitfully. So let's take full advantage of the blessings that God offers to us. We're to use good judgment in what's required, not too much, not too little, and not too slow.